Yes, ma'am. So I'll begin today's topic. My name is Dr. Mubashir Babar. I'm a second year junior resident doctor uh, enrolled in DNB diploma program in ENT at Sir H. N. Reliance Hospital Foundation, Mumbai. Today's topic is going to be asymmetric hearing loss and CP angle tumor. This session will be moderated by Dr. Smita Nagaonkar. She's our HOD and guide. To begin, the background for today's presentation is uh, usually general practitioners are usually the first point of contact for patients with hearing loss. Asymmetrical sensory neural hearing loss can be a symptom of a wide range of diseases. And a correct diagnosis is essential for appropriate treatment and limitation of the progression of hearing loss. The objective of today's presentation is to give an outline for an approach to a patient who is presenting with asymmetrical sensory neural hearing loss and also to provide a brief summary of four disease process which may present with asymmetric hearing loss. The discussion for today's presentation is about asymmetrical sensory neural hearing loss may be secondary to the process of aging or simply be related to excessive noise exposure. However, our major focus is about since this asymmetric loss be the only presenting system symptom of vestibular schwannoma or an intracranial tumor and a high level of clinical suspicion is required to ensure that these pathologies are not missed. So beginning defining asymmetric hearing loss. So asymmetric hearing loss may be defined as an interaural difference of more than 10 decibels using the average value of air conduction thresholds in the Pyoton audiometry for 500, 1000, 2000 as well as 4000 Hertz frequencies. Asymmetric hearing loss can occur between two sick ears or one sick ear and another healthy ear. Okay. Hearing loss may span from mild to profound and vary from sensory neural to mixed or conductive. Therefore, the greater the difference between the both the ears, the greater the asymmetry is going to be. So what is the, our approach and history taking? going to be. So approaching the patient of asymmetric sensory neural hearing loss, the only it is the only presenting symptom of a vestibular schwannoma or an intracranial tumor. It is an indicator of another serious underlying pathological process such as an autoimmune disorder or demyelinating disease. Or it can also be associated with conditions such as idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss or Meniere's disease, which may require specialist reference. And dual pathologies here is not uncommon in the causation of sensory neural hearing loss. One thing it is important to establish the pattern of the hearing loss, whether unilateral or bilateral symptoms, whether it is progressive or stepwise, sudden or gradual in the onset. The associated symptoms are also important such as tinnitus, oral fullness, vertigo, imbalance, otalgia and otoria. History of previous ear infections, noise exposure, otic barotrauma or ear surgery also plays major important and major role in differential diagnosis. Moving further, history of trauma to the ear or head, history of previous intracranial surgeries, general health conditions such as cerebrovascular diseases, diabetes or other metabolic and autoimmune disorders can affect hearing as well. 
family history should also be taken into consideration of hearing loss or ear related tumors use of medications such as antibiotics especially aminoglycosides which are ototoxic anti malarial drugs anti inflammatory agents nsaids salicylates or chemotherapeutic agents and diuretics history should also be taken Moving further to the clinical examination in asymmetric hearing loss. So starting with the basic ENT examining examination. So how the auricles are, if there are any skin lesions, if there is any preauricular sinuses, presence of edema, erythema, tragal tenderness. Okay, all the ENT doctors who are attending uh, this lecture right now, they must be, you know, thinking of the differential diagnosis with all the important clinical examination I've just laid out. All right. We, we can comment on the external auditory canal, whether there is a mass occupying lesion, whether there's an active discharge going on. Okay. Whether the canal is dry, tympanic membrane, whether intact, not intact, the color, thickness, scarring, effusion, perforation. Okay. Head and neck general examinations, cranial nerve examination, and as well as post nasal spaces. Okay, a thorough general ENT examinations to be done. Okay, with clinical examinations, the this I have taken uh, from a uh, PubMed about examples of pathologies which are associated with sudden neural hearing loss. Okay, it can be either hereditary and developmental, can be because of infectious causes, can be because of immune disorders can be neurological neoplasma uh, neoplasms ototoxic drugs systemic traumatic in nature vascular or maybe idiopathic so all this becomes like a differential diagnosis or key point in understanding what may lead to the sensory neural hearing loss or maybe the patient is coming to you with uh, uh, you know asymmetric hearing loss so all this uh, differential uh, it helps in your differential diagnosis and such key diseases can be you know kept in mind while doing the clinical examination now moving forward to your investigations so audiology test we perform so routine audiology testing which includes pyotone audiometry speech discrimination test impedance tympanometry evoked potential audiometry which also includes audio brainstem responses and electrocochleography may be used in particular circumstances as well imaging which are used in asymmetric uh, sensory neural hearing loss will generally necessitate the use of mri of the ear, inner ear and brain to exclude retrocochlear pathologies such as vestibular schwannoma meningioma or other intracranial tumors signs of demyelinating lesions of central nervous system may also be identified with mri contrast the usual mri brain contrast we use is the gadolinium scans ct scanning may also be used if inner ear pathology or developmental anomaly are there or suspected such as inner ear dysplasia or large vestibular aqueduct. Moving forward, in such patients, we can opt for serological, hematological and biochemistical evaluations as well. So hematological, biochemical and serological test may be useful in investigating hearing loss and choice of investigation will be de determined by the history and positive examination findings. Okay. So like, for example, if you are suspecting syphilis, uh, uh, causing the symptoms so you can opt for fluorescent treponemal antibody if there is diabetes uh, symptoms of tinnitus you can opt for fasting blood sugar level HbA1c you can opt for ESR uh, a full uh, autoimmune uh, test to rule out autoimmune vestibulitis or vestibular pathology so you are uh, prescribing ESR ANA test rheumatoid factors for screening in patient with suspected immune causes of hearing loss. All right. Just to summarize, uh, uh, asymmetric sensory uh, neural hearing loss 
it can be a present in system, uh, symptom of a range of disease processes thorough history and examination are invaluable directing further investigations and all asymmetric uh, uh, hearing loss must be investigated for sudden sensory neural hearing loss meniere's disease and other important conditions and the topic of r important conditions should not be missed including vestibular schwannomas and other cp angle tumors which will start now this were the references for the uh, my previous presentation now starting with our uh, main topic cp angle tumor so what is cp angle tumor the cerebellopontine angle is an important landmark anatomy as well as clinically the most common lesions at the cpa are vestibular schwannoma meningioma and epidermoid treatment options for this include observation radio surgery and micro surgery this presentation today's presentation reviews the evaluation as well as management of cp angle tumors and review the role of interprofessional team in improving care for such patients all right so our objective for today is to summarize the etiology of cere cerebellopontine angle tumors explain the evaluation of patients of cpa tumors and outline a management so this is just an image of inner ear vestibular schwannoma presenting the tumor etiology so beginning with our first objective of etiology cpa tumors are mostly benign they are slow growing tumors with low potential for malignancy almost around 1% the etiology of vestibular schwannoma it remains unknown however there are two major types of uh, vestibular schwannoma either first sporadic sporadic natures are unilateral tumors and most commonly it present between the fourth and the sixth decade of life neurofibromatosis type nf2 it results from a mutation at chromosome 22q12 this mutation it leads to an increased risk of other intracranial tumors as well okay there can be differential diagnosis whether it can be a schwannoma it can be a meningioma it can be epidermoid tumors or can be arachnoid cysts so what are schwannomas schwannomas are basically primary lesions of cranial nerves involving the trigeminal facial glossopharyngeal vagus and sometimes even accessory cranial nerve so schwannomas are basically primary lesions of cranial nerves what are meningiomas meningiomas are proliferations of arachnoid meningothelial cells which are most commonly from the dura of petrous temporal bone or internal auditory meatus next is our epidermoid tumors which arises from congenital misplacement of ectodermal cells during the closure of the neural tube and lastly the arachnoid cysts which are csf filled cysts that arise from the splitting of embryonic arachnoid membrane moving forward the histology uh, histological differences in vestibular schwannoma the microscopic composition it includes antony a cells or antony b antony a are well organized bipolar cells forming palisades and antony b are loosely organized myxoid tissues with strong s100 positivity meningiomas has a varied histological appearance which can be classified into meningothelial or fibroblastic or transitional and it can be graded by who grading of 1 to 3 based on their histopathological features and prognosis epidermoid tumors are cystic lesions with squamous epithelium and keratin which grow slowly with congenital with other adjoining congenital abnormalities arachnoid cyst these are csf filled cyst here 
they have delicate fibrous walls lined by meningothelial cells containing cerebrospinal or xanthochromic fluid with heterogeneous appearances and lipomas are fatty tumors causing bone erosions permitting passage of nerves and blood vessels without any displacement now moving forward to our second objective in evaluation of our patient okay so in evaluation what are we going to do okay so for diagnosis we have to take the patient history we are going to do a physical examination we'll do a ent examination we'll uh, ask the patient for an audiometry test all right since this is a hearing loss case uh, presenting symptom and maybe if deemed necessary we are prescribing mri which is going to be the gold standard over here okay and a ct scan if there is going to be a bony involvement all right so whenever we are prescribing uh, the scans so in scans what we get is in vestibular schwannoma in scans we get isodens on ct scan hypo intense on t1 and hyper intense on t2 mri this i have summarized for every one of us to understand okay and in meningioma we get hyper dense on ct hypo intense on t1 and hyper intense on t2 mri and the distinct features include lack of internal auditory canal erosion and dural tail sign advanced mri techniques can also be performed and specific feature gives a differentiated differentiation or better information such as like ice cream cone shape sign or appearance adjacent hyperostosis or presence of calcification okay so let's take vestibular schwannoma as of now and we'll go through it so what is vestibular schwannoma it is benign it is slow growing uh, it encapsulate tumor eighth cranial nerve it is also known as acoustic neuroma or cp angle tumor okay uh, classifying a vestibular schwannoma it is intracapsular confined within the iac uh, it is to classify with the size it is small size if it is up to 1.5 cm it is of medium size ranging from 1.5 to 4 cm and a large size schwannoma if it is more than 4 cm okay jacker classification so jacker classification uh, for intramiatal tumor okay so grade 1 2 3 4 5 depending upon the size so it is uh, going to be uh, small uh, if it is 1 to 10 mm 1 to uh, till 1 centimeter medium till 2 centimeter 1 to 2 centimeter moderately large from 2 to 3 centimeter large if 3 to 4 centimeter and giant grade 5 more than 4 centimeter Next is the Simpson criteria. So the Simpson's criteria of completeness of tumor removal. Okay. It again gives three graded. Okay. Grade one, two, and three. Okay. So of complete resection. So Simpson's criteria, it summarizes the completeness of tumor removal. If, if in grade one, if complete removal, including underlying bone and associated dura matter is done, there is a recurrence of five to uh, nine percent. Uh, 10 year recurrence in uh, grade 2 if complete removal and coagulation of dural attachment uh, 10 year recurrence is 15 to 19 percent in grade 3 complete removal without resection of dural co coagulation then there is more higher recurrence till 29 percent okay whose grading scale whose grading scale is frequently used as classification system for vestibular schwannoma so classified again as grade one two three and four so grade one is a small intracranial tumor grade two is a small tumor with protrusion into the cerebellopontine cistern and there is no contact whatsoever with the brain stem grade three is basically like a tumor occupying cere cerebellopontine cistern with no brain stem displacement okay and grade 4 is basically a large tumor with brain stem as well as your cranial nerve but of course cranial nerve displacement this is the cruise grading uh, classification for vestibular schwannoma 
all right so evaluating further what all the audiology tests you can do in vestibular schwannoma you can do a uh, pyotone audiometry you can do speech audiometry can see rollover phenomena rollover phenomena when you are increasing the decibel the patient is hearing less recruitment phenomena short increment sensitivity index threshold tone decay test or stepidal reflex decay test but with pt and speech audiometry itself you can uh, figure out that there is major problem going on okay differential diagnosis in such case can be your meningioma a cochlear pathology meniere's disease lipoma or epidermoid uh, cholesterol granuloma cholesteatoma arachnoid cyst maybe aneurysm uh, metastatic disorders or schwannoma of other cranial nerve uh, b or trigeminal facial glossopharyngeal vacuus or spinal accessory so surgical approach in such cases it is our first treatment of choice so the surgical approach it depends upon the size of the tumor and extent of the tumor so whether the tumor is involving the brain stem or it is not uh, whether you, you know uh, depending upon the recurrence rate uh, depending upon the type of patient you have okay so the surgical approaches can be from middle cranial fossa or it can be a trans labyrinthine approach as well sub occipital or retro sigmoid approach can also be done or a combined trans labyrinthine and sub sub occipital approach can also be taken what are the usual post op complications so the usual post op complications can be uh, sensory neural hearing loss uh, temporary facial nerve palsy and there will be balance problem there can be csf leak and then our subsequent repair for it to be done meningitis these are the common usual complications what are the rare complications rare complications will be stroke intracranial bleeding pneumocephalus cerebellar ataxia or even death prognosis in such cases cerebrospontane tumors are usually benign tumor and they are slow growing tumors the treatment outcome it depends upon the size location as well as the consistency of the tumor delayed treatment is associated with poor outcomes and therefore early detection and treatment are essential post operative imaging should be carefully reviewed to differentiate normal post surgical changes from recurrence all right lastly the complications the most complications following radio surgery are cranial neuropathy hydrocephalus and brain stem cerebellar injury complications following surgery can include headache hemorrhage stroke vascular injury infection cranial nerve injury tumor recurrence occurring csf leak and death conventional surgical complications involve cranial nerve dysfunction which is due to lesions of your uh, seven nerve uh, fifth nerve or vestibular cochlear nerve and approximately 10% of cases of trigeminal neuralgia have been attributed to secondary to cpa tumors so we had a uh, one case in our hospital online right? long term uh, long time back uh, this was a case of uh, acoustic neuroma in an 18 year old male online right? this 18 year old male uh, he presented with complaints of minimal asymmetric hearing loss in his right ear it was barely about 10 decibels all right and uh, this minimal asymmetric hearing loss was noted on pta and uh, during this time he didn't had any uh, significant other ent complaints of whatsoever and uh, he was asked to do a follow up in 6 months all right so followed uh, he followed up in the ent opd after 6 months for a repeat pta that's what's prescribed on our first visit itself but he followed up in 6 months with a history of intermittent headache since the past 3 months paresthesia in the right side uh, side of the face since the past 7 days and vomiting since 2 2 2 days no other systemic complaints so to describe his headache 
the headache was gradually in onset three months back it was progressively increasing in intensity and it was uh, aggravated by exertion especially while reading he was an 18 year old kid a uh, college student uh, and it was relieved by rest and pain meds over the last two months patient had severe episodes of early morning headaches due to which he had to wake up from his sleep and uh, since the past two days he was also complaining of nausea and vomiting all right past history there, there there was no significant past history of any chronic disease whatsoever no long term medications going on no hospitalization no surgery no radiation exposure whatsoever there was no family history of hearing loss no family history of comorbidities etc nil significant all right personal history he was a college student he wasn't occupied in any occupation there was there were no uh, personal habits and he was not also on any long term medications for any disease whatsoever general examination young man he was oriented with time place and persons vitals normal bp normal temperature normal respiratory rate all good no pallor jaundice cyanosis clubbing edema uh, jugular venous pressure everything good nil significant no muscle wasting as well we did a cranial nerve examination since he had complaints of uh, facial paresthesia so cranial nerve uh, normal bilaterally uh, nerve to pupil light reflexes normal uh visual fields within normal limits okay cranial nerve uh, no abnormality detected extraocular movements also within normal range okay uh on fifth nerve examination we saw a uh, corneal reflex sluggish on the right side and on sensation uh cotton sniff test uh, there was paresthesia in all three uh, divisions on the right sides jaw movements uh, there was weakness on uh, pterygoid and masseter on the right side and jaw jerk was present and uh, general sensations of taste on tongue was there and oral cavity was also normal no ulcers mucositis nothing at all like that uh, cranial nerve 7 uh, grade 3 facial nerve palsies was given so basically a uh, gross but not disfiguring difference between the two sides and not severe synkinesis contracture or hemifacial spasms are there at rest there is a normal symmetry of the face all right rest all the other cranial nerve examinations they were all within the normal limits locomotor examination as well there were no muscle wasting no fasciculations no abnormal movement power was 5 by 5 in all the limbs prones were normal reflexes normal gait was also normal for this patient uh sorry uh, this is ent examination so in ent examination with the otoscopic examination and it revealed normal uh, tympanic membranes bilaterally no neurological deficits were noted and uh, we uh, send the patient for an audiometric evaluation since we had his pta of 6 months back as well so audiometric evaluation confirmed sensorineural hearing loss in the right ear and this time the asymmetry was more than 50 decibels so the patient was prescribed uh, mri brain with contrast im protocol and uh, this revealed that there was a well circumscribed uh, enhancing lesion arising from the vestibular nerve 6 cm in size which was consistent with vestibular schwannoma uh, the patient was referred to neurosurgery team for further evaluation and management all our findings were also confirmed by the neurosurgical team all right after discussion with the patient and family uh, a surgical resection of the vestibular schwannoma was uh, recommended and uh, neuro uh, neurosurgery team uh, in this hospital uh, successfully uh, did the surgical resection of the uh, tumor all right on follow up uh, on follow post operatively the right ear was a dead ear uh, they had uh, taken both labyrinthine and uh, uh, trans uh, occipital approach 
and the patient was monitored closely for any signs of recurrence so a repeat mri was prescribed like annually for this patient and complications there there were nil complications after the surgery and uh, is he is a uh, like uh, living healthy and going and attending his college and everything so conclusion uh, what we realize is acoustic neuroma vestibular schwannoma it should be considered in young patients like we cannot uh, say that uh, there is a asymmetric hearing loss and maybe think uh, okay uh, this neuromas are happening in fourth decade or sixth decade of life it may not occur with young patient sometime the history is also very misleading to us okay so there should all in our uh, ent field when a good being a good uh, ent physician and surgeon you should always uh keep an open mind of possibilities okay like uh, such rare entities can also happen all right and timely diagnosis and intervention uh especially surgical dissection can you know lead to favorable outcomes also now this case to presentation uh this uh, happened uh, all of a sudden with me uh, this happened when i joined uh, reliance uh, an year back and it was only uh, two months of me joining uh, this institute okay and uh, this patient is a like a auntie of mine uh, who is living in delhi so she is a 50 year old female with comorbidities and uh, she gave me a history of uh, progressive asymmetric hearing loss in her left ear uh, she also gave history of uh, headache which was intermittent in nature uh, self resolving tinnitus which used to come and go and it wasn't worrisome or bothersome for her there was no history of nausea vomiting or giddiness and she only had a history of hypertension so basically what happened was uh, she had done her uh, routine annual uh, checkup in delhi and uh, she also did a pyoton uh, audiometry in which uh, she had a like asymmetric hearing loss in her left ear her otoscopic examination was completely normal finding audiometric uh, shows progressive sensory neural hearing loss pro predominantly affecting the left ear consisting with her symptoms uh, this asymmetry was more on the higher frequency of around 30 to 50 decibel gap and during her annual uh, checkup in a reputed hospital in delhi she was prescribed only hearing aids okay so despite initially being prescribed hearing aid during a primary care executive health checkup she continued to experience this progressive symptoms and after a month's time of that checkup she had called me and given me this history and she was like are uh, you have started to being trained uh, as ENT resident right so like can you get get me a teleconsultation in mumbai as well so during this time uh, i like uh, had done a teleconsultation uh, with uh, dr smita madam so madam has seen and uh, her first like without a doubt her first uh, uh, you know uh, recommendation was this is an asymmetry and we should not be taking lightly and we should get a mri brain im protocol done so mri brain im protocol was recommended uh, to her and within a week's time she went and uh, she uh, did the scan in that very same hospital and she was diagnosed of acoustic neuroma all right then she was referred to aims delhi hospital for further management all right at aims delhi hospital she underwent uh, gamma knife surgery it was a 2 cm mass okay uh, 1.82 cm mass and she underwent gamma knife surgery and uh, the post op care was also uneventful and she recovered well and she was uh, advised to follow up bi uh, biannually uh, for pta test and annually for mri im protocol from aims delhi there so the conclusion of case 2 is that this case highlights the importance of considering acoustic neuroma in patients with progressive asymmetric hearing loss even in presence of comorbidities like diabetes mellitus or hypertension and timely diagnosis just i have said before 
timely diagnosis especially with imaging modalities such as MRI and prompt referral as well can lead to successful management and improve outcome for our patients okay so uh, this was uh, my humble attempt in uh, presenting to you uh, my experience with uh, asymmetric hearing loss and cp angle tumor uh, learned under uh, dr uh, smita nagarkar madam and uh, since the past uh, one year of my residency uh, there are a lot many cases which she have uh, has successfully diagnosed in the ENT OPD itself and she has uh, given timely referral to our uh, neurosurgical team who have uh, you know uh, with amalgation have uh, given better uh, output in our patients like that. So I hope like uh, if uh, anyone gets uh, uh, asymmetric hearing loss, uh, maybe we should not shy away from uh, prescribing, uh, you know, better uh, investigations or a thorough examinations and all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Smita Nagaukar, Madam, uh, to uh, share few words and uh, enlighten other DNB candidates as well. Hello. Yes. Um, thank yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mubashir, for your presentation. Um, I would like to just make a little uh, note here that mm -hmm. looking at the audiogram in our OPDs, mm -hmm. we try to uh, we try to ignore certain things, or maybe we don't get uh, enough. We don't give enough attention to investigate further. So that was the whole idea of uh, this session, I guess, so that mm -hmm. this particular asymmetry need not be just the plain asymmetry. There could be something more about it that we need to investigate further. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we conclude? Yes, uh, we may conclude and uh, yeah, like someone has asked for this presentation. Uh, yes, I may share the presentation. I'll upload it on the DNB website with that. And uh, we in the past one year, we actually have got uh, five to six uh, CP angle cases. And uh, hopefully this is our vision that uh, uh, with the neuro team and uh, with uh, proper uh, ethics committee uh, uh, sanctions and all will be uh, maybe do a publication soon about ENT role in early diagnosis of CP angle tumors and timely intervention. So this is our goal. So hope for the best. Yeah. Thank you very much. A few questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for this. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Mubash. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all time your faculty members. Uh, so, uh, yeah. There are other treatment modalities are also available. Yes, yes. Like wait and watch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, gamma knife therapy. So we have now discussed these modalities. Mm -hmm. And when you decide which approach should be taken for which patient, that is also not discussed. Mm -hmm. And for all asymmetric hearing loss, mm -hmm. it should be clear. Mm -hmm. Patient should go for MRI with contrast. Yes. Although the sensitivity of uh, if you do all asymmetric hearing loss, mm -hmm. or for example, 100 cases, we could mm -hmm. count around in two to three cases, there may be vascular shunoma or CP angle tumor. Mm -hmm. So it's a protocol. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me when you go for uh, uh, wait and watch therapy and when you will go for gamma nice therapy? So like in our first case, uh, he, according to the definition, he had asymmetrical hearing loss. He didn't had any other significant ENT complaints, okay, no nausea, vomiting, giddiness, no headache, okay, we have ruled out the other differential diagnosis as well, and it was very minute. So during his first visit itself, uh, we had asked him to do a repeat PTA in six months. So here we are observing. So like I have started my uh, PPT also with uh, when to observe. So since this was very minimal, we had asked for a 
follow up and during this six months time uh, he had started developing symptoms uh, like headache and facial paralysis and everything and he had come to us and the first thing only which we did was the audiometry and that asymmetry had increased by a lot by I want to correct you here mm -hmm. so patient yes. should not be followed on audiometry whenever patient came with asymmetric hearing loss should go for MRI because yes, sir. there may, may not be any collaboration between the tumor size and audiometric finding. You may yes. find milder SNHL or large mm -hmm. tumor size or uh, mm -hmm. small tumor size with significant profound SNHL. So it mm -hmm. is not all, all patients should go for MRI. So yes. rather than following with the PTA should follow uh -huh. with MRI. If MRI is negative, then you can do uh, mm -hmm. wait and watch. Like even you'd go for surgery in such cases, mm -hmm. SNHL will not recover. It mm -hmm. will persist. Yes. It will pass. Uh, so if tumor is not involving other structures and if it is not increasing in size and patient is of advanced age, yes, in sir. that case, we can follow the patient. But if tumor is less than three centimeter size mm -hmm. and other all other structures are preserved, mm -hmm. then in that case, gamma knife can be done. Yeah. And, and yes. if a tumor is more than three centimeter size and if it is lateral tumor, like mm -hmm. if it is involving lateral part of CP angle, mm -hmm. in that case, middle cranial fossa approach can be given can mm -hmm. be done and hearing is serviceable that means mm -hmm. above 60 db mm -hmm. or if it is medial side then retro uh, sigmoid approach and mm -hmm. if there is a significant snhl above 60 db then can go for trans approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so message right. should be clear from this presentation yes sir. So, uh, yes sir thank you Mubashir, uh, i think mm -hmm. it was a decent time uh, Dr. Hitesh, can I take uh, no? Yeah, yes. So uh, many things Dr. Hitesh has already cleared. Mm -hmm. And uh, wait and watch, as he said, should be for a diagnosed case of vestibular schwannoma, not mm -hmm. a suspected case. So, not a suspected case. Uh, radiologically diagnosed case of uh, vestibular schwannoma. Understood, sir. Understood, sir. So in your presentation, uh, I can see that a few of the trainees are asking for a presentation. So. Firstly, I would like to make some corrections in a presentation yes, so sir. that they don't get uh, there were some uh, shortcomings. Yes, sir. You have written intracapsular. It's actually intracanalicular in your first classification which you presented. Okay, so it will be intracanalicular, not the intracapsular. Right? Sir. Yes, sir. Then uh, you have written uh, yes. in first case uh, repeat PT annually to follow up the case. Yes, sir. That is that should be uh, annually MRI, not the PTA. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Hearing is already gone. You can't go it's for gone. repeat PTA annually to follow up and a surgically resected case of, uh, you know, vestibular schwannoma. Mm -hmm. It should be MRI. MRI. Right, right. Right ear was dead ear. So yes. that uh, means otherwise mm -hmm. the others will get the wrong message in that. Correct, correct. That needs yes, to be correct. Uh, correct. Third, so you my annual PTA was for the gamma knife and an annual uh, MRI uh, in the case two. In the first case, that is the right. Yes, I will do the correction. And uh, second, yes. thirdly, uh, you have mentioned six centimeters vestibular schwannoma, which is a significant size tumor. Significant. And you have written there were no other uh, uh, neurotological, you know, uh, signs and uh, signs and symptoms. So that is something which is uh, not corroborating, uh, you know. Uh, Clinical and the radiological things are usually six centimeters. It's a huge schwannoma. So there must be, uh, you know, uh, this either brain, either the tumor size was less, or if it is six centimeter, usually they present with the brain stem or uh, cerebellar symptoms. Okay. Then uh, MRI, if suppose you are suspecting asymmetrical hearing loss, mm -hmm. so the first thing you will advise will be MRI without any doubt. Yes, sir. If it is not a sudden sensorial hearing loss, if mm -hmm. it is sudden, you may still try for steroids, and uh, that's a different protocol. Mm -hmm. But if the patient is coming to you with the hearing loss or with the no hearing loss on screening, you have found some, uh, you know, uh, asymmetrical hearing loss, mm -hmm. then you should advise MRI. Especially, and, uh, you don't require very fancy. Uh, usually, we uh, you should go for a complete audiological test battery, which you have uh, missed out in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Because they have very interesting findings uh, uh, in case of vestibular schwannoma, but at least uh, you can go for speech discrimination score. 
with your routine setup also you can go for uh, these uh, test for retrocochlear uh, the, uh, this recruitment and recruitment phenomena you can go for decay own decay yes yes sir yes sir you can go for and uh, so you should not uh, you know uh, uh, you should not follow the uh, call the patient after 6 months at least you are finding unilateral snhl you uh -huh. can do this test as a screening in the beginning so that you can have some idea and so these are two comments from my side and yes, uh, so i that's all from my side thank you very much sir thank you very much sir i'll make the necessary changes in the slides sir thank you very much for your input sir